God wants to make a spiritual and practical difference in our daily lives. He also wants to make a positive spiritual difference in the lives of others, which is what Pastor Scott will be talking about this morning. What does it look like when we put God's Word into play in our lives? That is the question we'll be answering this morning. So let's begin by opening our Bibles or following along in your bulletin. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Last week we looked at the eight beatitudes or the eight blessings that God wants to bestow on each and every one of us. This week we begin the process of of experiencing what it is like when we live out the Beatitudes in our life. Specifically today, we begin a, a journey on how to be a positive influence in what can be at times a very negative, even evil world. Now to do that, we need to live as heads-up people. And that's an athletic term. Oftentimes you'll hear that uh, uh, on a baseball diamond. And you say heads up to someone because, well, there's a ball coming in their direction. Sometimes very fast. And you say heads up to the other person because there is this threat that is coming their way. And... Jesus very much wants to give give us a heads up. He wants to remind us that yes, we do live in a, a very challenging, at times dark and evil world. And he doesn't want that darkness to overcome us. He doesn't want us to be negatively impacted by that evil, just the opposite, as we'll learn today. He wants us to be able to make a a positive difference, be a positive influence in what is often a challenging, unjust, evil, dark world. To do that, we can't be on automatic pilot. That's often why you say heads up to somebody because they're not aware of the ball coming in their direction. Jesus wants us to put the Beatitudes into play in our life, and over the next several weeks, we'll be looking at what that, uh, what does that look like in our day-to-day lives. Today, we begin with Jesus' challenge to be salt and light in the world. So let's begin with, let's begin with salt. How do we, how do we shake things up? as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And we are to shake things up, and we're to shake them up in a very positive way because to be the salt of the world, the light of the world, means to be a positive influence. Notice what Jesus says in verse 13. He says, you are the light, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the world. Now, notice that he doesn't just say that you're the salt of your own world. He gives us a very global perspective, doesn't he? And it's interesting that when we have a a global perspective on what God is doing, we can then uh, bring that back down to an understanding of our own world. That God does have a a plan and a purpose for the world, for all of history. But he does very much have a plan and a purpose for 
our lives, for history today. So we're to be salt what? What does salt do? How, how do we use salt? And since I got snowed in, I, I did a little Googling. And uh, I, I found out, you may not know this, there are over 14,000 different uses for salt. 14,000. When Jesus talks about salt, I think he's talking about three specific uses for salt. One use for salt is you use it as a preservative. I like to go fish salmon in Alaska, and when, uh, when we come back from Alaska, one of my fishing partners turns it into smoked salmon for me, and part of that process is to salt it so it preserves. And, and, and I'll tell you, once it's turned into smoked salmon and it's vacuum-packed well, that stuff lasts for decades once it's like that. It, it preserves for a long time. Number two is salt is designed to add flavor. Most recipes for food, especially uh, things like meats, they almost all uh, contain salt and pepper to add, to add flavor. That salt and pepper is not to, uh, to overshadow the natural flavor, for instance, of the meat, but it's designed to what? Enhance the flavor of the food. And then the third thing is, is that uh, salt purifies things. Depending on what you combine salt with, you can use it to turn lots of things white. Everything from your teeth to your clothes to the dirty grout on your tile. What does it do? It purifies, it whitens things. Jesus says you're to be the salt of the earth. You're to preserve. You're to flavor and you're to purify. What does it mean to preserve? What are we to preserve when we go out into the world? And simply, we are to go out into the world and we are to make and keep God's direction and course, His will constant out in the world. We're to preserve the Christian faith as we go out into the world. We are to preserve the morals and the values represented in the Scriptures out into the world. Now, that's a challenge. And as we will look at, uh, as we look at light, there's a lot of challenges out in the world, aren't there? That's one of the, uh, the, the minuses, so to speak, or perhaps a plus of instant media is instantaneously we can find out about what darkness there is, what evil there is, what injustice there is in the world. And as we move out into the world, we realize that we have a, a battle on our hands, don't we? Paul makes that clear, doesn't he, in Ephesians. Life is a, a battle, it's a challenge. And our job is to preserve the values, the morals, the ethos is the big word for it, the theological word, the ethos of the Christian faith as we go out into the world, which will be a challenge. It will take perseverance to preserve our values and our morals as we go out into the world, to not be compromised, to not have those eroded away. What happens to a, a fish if it's not preserved uh, with salt? It does what? It decays. And our Christian morals and values, the ethos of our faith, as we go out into the world, it's eroding out there. And so it, it needs us to come and sprinkle a little salt on it wherever we go. To be a reminder 
that the morals, the values that are supreme are God's morals, God's values, God's way of living, God's will. Number two, we're supposed to flavor things. That means whenever and wherever you go, you should, uh, you should do good. You should be a positive difference wherever and whenever you go. Everybody has some bad days. And I don't know about you, I'm an extrovert, so if I have a bad day, I'm pretty good at sharing that with those I come in contact with. I share the good days too. But you can read me like a book. As we go, we're to make a positive difference wherever and whenever we can. Wouldn't it be great, and I think it is the vast majority of the time, when somebody's in trouble, when somebody needs help, they say, oh boy, there's a Christian here. And that's been the history of the Christian church, hasn't it? There is virtually not one good thing that has happened on this planet over history that Christians didn't have a positive influence in. Everything from hospitals to schools. Everything from feeding the hungry to housing those that don't have housing. Christians have been on the front end. The injustice of the slavery movement, Christians were on the front end of that worldwide in the United States. Whenever and wherever we go, we ought to look to make a positive difference. It might be something profound, but I can guarantee you it'll also be something very simple. All you, all you need to do is have a little bad weather and lots of simple opportunities come up, right? Everything from shoveling snow to calling your neighbor and asking if they need anything at the, uh, at the grocery store because you've got studded snow tires on your car and you can get there and back without too much trouble. Whenever, wherever you go, make a positive difference. When we realize that uh, we're the ones that are pushing forward God's will as we go out into the world, and we do that in such a way that, uh, uh, that we do it in large ways and small ways, we also find ourselves encouraging, as Paul points out in Philippians 4.8, doing what is right and good, what is true and holy. That's Paul's encouragement to the Philippians. He says, do what's right, do what's good, do what's true, and do what's holy. Now, doing what's holy is the idea that, that we're set apart. We're, we're set apart from the world, but yet we're to be in the world. And as we, and as we preserve God's will, God's way in the world, as we flavor whenever and wherever we go, we are to also purify and encourage what is right, what is true, what is good, and what is holy. And what a, a difference that makes. Now, many times it's easy to do what is right and good, what is true and holy, but sometimes that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Not everybody wants you to do what's true. Not everybody wants you to do what's right. Not, not everybody's interested in doing what's holy. And so it is a, a challenge to be salt out into the world. In fact, Jesus gives us a little warning, doesn't he? Verse 13, he says, we need to heed Jesus' warning to not lose our saltiness. The challenge about going out into the world 
is that it's a challenge. But we're called to go out in the world. We're not called to create a bunker mentality. That's easy to do. It's easy to create a little bunker, a little holy huddle, and say, you know, one way to, to preserve and one way to flavor and, uh, and, and one way to, to purify and not lose our saltiness is to not go very far. But it's interesting that Jesus' command is that we're to go all the way to the other end of the planet and be salt. And if we do that, we need to what? Be careful that we don't lose our saltiness. We need to be careful that as we go out into the world that our, our ideals, our call and response to God's will is not compromised, is not watered down. And that is a, a challenge in this world, isn't it? That's a, a challenge I feel just about every day. Because as I go about the community, people know who I am as disguised as I get. I mean, I had a hat on, I was all muddy, sunglasses on, and somebody figured out who I was. That's why I have to keep my bad days to a minimum. Because you hear about them if I have one. And it is a challenge as we go out into the world. Because it's, it's easy to capitulate to what everyone else wants, to what other people demand. Because not everyone's aspiration is what is good and right, what is true and holy. But that is to be our aspiration as we go out into the world. As we go out into the world, we should become a, and be a positive influence whenever and wherever we go. Not everyone, that's not everyone's aspiration. As we go out into the world, we're to reflect to the world this, this great opportunity to understand and know personally the will of God. And once we align our life, our will with God's will, that makes all the difference, all the positive difference in our life. Not only now, but for all eternity. So we have to take the caution well. We have to live heads up as we go out into the world. We cannot be on automatic pilot. We're to be the salt of the earth. We're also called to be the light of the world. Look at verse 12. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. The key concept here theologically and practically is, is that we're to be light in darkness. And there's plenty of darkness that we're aware of in our world, isn't there? Now, we always should begin with ourselves and look at the darkness of our own life, but we, we realize that there's great darkness out there. There's, there is evil in this world. And when Jesus calls us to be a light in the darkness, he's talking about everything from our own attitude and behavior our bad attitude and behaviors. All the way to such things worldwide as sex trafficking, which I know you've learned more and more about over the last couple of years. It's those two extremes, so to speak, and everything in the middle. It's a personal concern, but it's also about injustice in the world. And we're called to be light in that world, in that dark world, in that evil world, in that unjust world. We're called to be light in the darkness because Jesus came to be the light of the world. And we're aspiring to be fully devoted followers of him. This is how John 
pointed it out, highlighted it for us. The Word gave life to everything that was created. And His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Wow. We know who wins in the end. As we go out seeking to be salt, do what's good, right, true, and holy, we might have the experience of feeling as though we were defeated in our endeavor. But ultimately, we know who wins out. Jesus does. What's good and right, true and holy, finally wins out. Ultimately wins out. And you may experience a a defeat or two on the way, but ah, don't give up the faith. In the end, God will use you, your, your good actions and attitudes. He will use them to make a positive difference, even though it might not look like it in the moment. We're called to take up the challenge of being disciples of Jesus Christ. Here's how Jesus put it. Verse 16. Let your good deeds, notice deeds is plural, not singular. It's got more than one thing for you to go out and do that's good. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Those in the darkness are lost, and it's interesting how how attracted to the light we are when we're lost. The darkest place that I've ever been to on this planet are the subway caves in Mount Lassen, California. There's a big lava flow, and it got a giant bubble in it. And now there's a cave there. And you can literally go down into the cave, and when you get into that cave and not very far into it it's amazing what you cannot see nothing it is you thought squim was the on a rainy night was the darkest place on this planet it's only the second darkest you can't see anything when you get into the subway cave And as you get in there, it's amazing how any illumination has a dramatic effect. It doesn't matter whether you have a a giant flashlight or just a match. Just a match illumines so much in that darkness. And I know as we think about being the light of the world, we want to say, yeah, but my light doesn't shine that strong. I, I don't have that many watts in me. But see, it doesn't matter how big your light is. A small amount of light in great darkness makes all the difference in the world. How do we make a difference? We make a difference by, by in terms of being light in the world, we make a difference by doing something very concrete and specific. I think Jesus' challenge here to good deeds is a challenge to do something concrete and something specific. The other Sunday, I, I didn't list everything that we're doing in terms of missions and ministry in our community. And the reason is, is the list is too long. And I'm convinced of what I said. There is not one good thing going on in this community that somebody from this church isn't a part of. And I think that's the way it ought to be. Everything from the Boys and Girls Club to the Salvation Army. Everything from Squim Community Aid to the Food Bank. And I I didn't make a list because then you can just keep going. Service opportunities. Places to be salt and light. And you ought to pick at least one thing. How many things, specific, concrete things, should we be a part of as a church? There's over 1,100 people that call Squim Community Church their home church. 
That means there should be 1,100 people involved as light in something concrete and specific. And my challenge to you today, if you don't have one concrete, specific place where you feel in this dark world you're not being salt and light, pick one. That's your challenge for the week. Find your specific, concrete place where you're going to be a positive, shining light in the midst of some difficulty, some challenge, some injustice, some wrong in this world. And it might be something very simple, but you never know, it might be something global, profound. When you go, your goodness should be good. And here's my caution to you. (laughs) When I was a Boy Scout, one of the things you have to teach people that have never been in darkness on a camp out is what to do with their flashlight when you run into them. You know what our natural tendency is with our flashlight when we're not used to using them? Put it right in the person's face. And when you do that, what does it do? It blinds them. I'll use the salt illustration. What happens if you salt your food too much? You might as well just throw it away because you you can't taste anything but the salt anymore. The caution I want to challenge you with as you look at good work is make sure your good work is good. Don't overwhelm those that you want to serve because it's easy to do sometimes. Sometimes. As we go to do something concrete and specific as light, uh, sometimes it's very simple, sometimes it's very profound, but it takes an engagement on our part to know how much salt and how much light. Because the ultimate goal is what Jesus says. The ultimate goal is, is that as you go in your light in the world, and you do your good works, and you love other people, it's to draw them to the love of God. And when we blind someone, if we oversalt someone, ah, that, that often doesn't draw them to Jesus Christ. And we want to ultimately draw them to Jesus Christ. We want to draw them to God's plan and purpose in their life because that's where the full life is. That's where the eternal life is in Jesus Christ. And there is a dark world out there that needs that illumination. There is an eroding life out there that needs some preserving and some flavoring and some purifying. And God calls us all to be salt and light, not just the elders, not just the deacons, not just the pastors of your church. How do we do that? How do we shake and shine as God calls us to? The first thing is, is we've got to make a decision, start today. If nothing else, identify that specific thing that you're going to be a part of or that you are a part of where you're to shake and shine. Number two, just do your very best. We often want to look at other people and say, oh, well, they're really good at doing all of that. But I'm not very good at doing this or that. Well, yes, you are. Don't be surprised. God shaped you for ministry and mission. And he has something specific where you're to be salt and light in this dark world. You need to find your place. And when you get there, you don't have to be like anybody else. You just have to do your very best. God will use it. He promises that he will use our best efforts. And then finally, we need to keep the faith. How do you make sure you don't blind somebody or salt somebody to death? The way you make sure that you're pointing them back to Jesus Christ is you keep the faith. 
You keep engaged with the Holy Spirit. That's why you can't be on automatic pilot. You have to have heads up living because the Holy Spirit will guide us and direct us so our efforts will be what? Magnified by His divine power. And that's what this dark world needs more than anything else. God's divine power, God's divine love, God's divine will. See, if we want to gather in the blessings of Jesus Christ and put them into play in our life, we can't help but be salt and light wherever we go, no matter who we encounter, no matter what circumstance we encounter. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to know that single thing. And perhaps there's far more than that, but Lord, today, let us begin with that single thing. And Lord, in in this moment, highlight what that endeavor opportunity is in our life. Or Lord, just in this moment, Uh, Get us viewing life and opportunity with the idea that that we're, as we respond to your call, we're going to get involved in one thing. Lord, our ultimate goal is that we do good. That, That our good deeds would draw people to you, that they would know your love, experience your love. Because, Lord, we're thankful that we know your love that we've experienced your love and that's been a a life-changing experience. Lord, we do want to be your your fully devoted followers. Lord, help us in this next week to shake and shine to your glory and your honor. Amen. Amen.